everybody. Ted Haggard here from the Storehouse in Colorado Springs, which is the house church ministry of St. James Church. And that's where Gail and I serve right now. I'm 67 years old. And so we delight in the people that come to our home twice a week. We meet on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And it is a wonderful, wonderful gathering of believers. All right. Today we are in Luke, the 16th chapter. Luke 16 is about you and money, your relationship to money, what money means to you, what bank accounts mean to you, what uh, what authority you give your time to being money or God. Now, you can serve God by using money, or you can use money to serve God, all right? But you have to decide what is the priority. Every one of us have to decide how this all fits in. And this entire chapter, Luke 16, is all about money. Everything in it is all about money. So let's begin by starting with verse 19. This is a story of the rich man and Lazarus. All right. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen who lived each day in luxury. Now, that's one of the purposes of money, so that we can buy a living situation where we are more comfortable. And uh, and God wants us to be comfortable, although in Lazarus's mind, or the rich man's mind, that comfort was a priority. The money was the priority. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. So in other words, the guy didn't look good. There he is, uh, a poor man named Lazarus. He was at his gate. So he's a homeless guy. All right. At Laz- as Lazarus lay there, longing for scraps from the rich man's table. In other words, he's laying there thinking about it. He's just a few feet from me, eating everything he can eat. Sounds like us. Living in perfect Comfort sounds like us. All right. The dogs would come and lick his open source. So here, Lazarus, this is a horrible situation he's in. The dogs are licking him as he lays there with sores on his body. He can't get around. He's there at the gate just hoping for uh, a few pieces of bread to be given to him. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. Now that happens. When you step out of your body, you remember you are a spirit that lives in a body. All right. And so your spirit lives forever. No, you can't commit suicide. You can't kill it. All right. But it can be separated from God. So some of you that don't know the Lord, when you die, the demons will welcome you and take you to a place of darkness, suffering, and pain. All right. For those of you that believe in the Lord, the angels will welcome you and uh, you'll be taken to heaven where Jesus rules, where nobody's sick, nobody's lonely, nobody's in pain, nobody's in uh, feeling rejection or hatred or any of those things that are all demonic things. All right. Now, it's important for you to know we step out of our bodies. We come within the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, just before our body dies, we step out of it, and then the angels or the demons greet us. Okay, so the poor man died. He was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. Okay, so all of this, this is a parable. And here we see a picture that Jesus draws for people, that people in torment, people that live for themselves, people that think money is so great and comfort is so important, those people are not believers, all right? Because their priority is their money, their bank account, their personal power, their influence. Okay, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham. Now, notice the communication that happens here. Here we have the rich man in darkness 
And he is able to see the poor man living lavishly now in eternity. And he's able to communicate with him. Have some pity on me. Now, that poor guy had been at his gate year after year after year, and he didn't have much pity on him. Now he's in eternity, and he's asking for pity. Isn't that interesting? That's why I say treat everybody as if you're going to need them sometime. You never know who's going to make a life decision about you in the future. And so my rule is you be respectful to the homeless guy, just like you'd be respectful to a uh, very influential, wealthy person. Okay, here it says, sin Lazarus, of all people, the guy he ignored all that year, all those years, or maybe just gave him scraps, sin Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. And everybody, listen, hell is real. Heaven is real. They are places where people go. And the difference is in hell, it's flames of fire. It's torment. It's awful for all eternity. In heaven, it's the glory and the majesty of God. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted. And Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. In other words, the whole idea of purgatory is not in the Bible. There is a chasm between heaven and hell. They are as different as light and darkness. All right? No one can cross over to you from here. Also, nobody can cross from there into Abraham's bosom, and no one can cross over to us from there, okay? So, verse 27, the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him, Lazarus, to my father's home, for for I have five brothers. I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. In other words, send Lazarus to my family to warn him about the reality of this, to to give them the message I'm giving you today. All right, now here's what's interesting about that. I hear people all the time say, well, if so-and-so would get healed, think of all the people that would come to Christ. Or uh, if angels would appear, or if we could do signs and wonders and miracles in our church, think of all the people that would come to Christ. I don't think God believes that. Now, I believe God does signs and wonders and miracles. I believe God does intervene in supernatural ways. It's obvious to us that the fingerprints of God are all over that situation. But here, he says, after after, um, the rich man asked that, Abraham responded, Moses and the prophets have warned them. In other words, when people say that, here's the issue. Every one of them have access to a Bible. Every one of them, every one of them have the scriptures. Now, if they in their infinite wisdom decide that they know more better, they know better than the scriptures, well, they're going to die and go to hell. All right. But if they will humble themselves, read what the Bible says and start growing in obedience to it, not perfection, just growing in obedience, they'll be perfect when they see him face to face. But But if they'll humble themselves and start receiving instruction, then that's a whole different thing. And here he's saying, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham. But if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. Well, Jesus was sent. He rose from the dead. And some people still won't repent. Most people won't. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, listen, everybody, that is the message. Okay, so back to verse 1. Jesus told this story to the disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what do I do? 
my boss has fired my boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig dishes, uh, ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. Now, this is the idea that friends are our friends for a reason. All right. I had a guy tell me one time, if you pay them, they're not your friends. That's generally true. All right. And so people are your friend for a reason. I have I have eight ATVs and I have friends because of those ATVs. If I didn't have those ATVs, they'd never come around. All right. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. So he starts giving away his employer stuff to get favor from people in the community. Employees do that all the time. You'll see a waitress give you some free stuff so that her tip will be bigger, but it costs the restaurant. It doesn't cost the waitress. I give away church money all the time. All right. When people give tithes and offerings to the church, like the tunnel for towers thing uh, for our wounded vets, we support that every month and all that kind of thing. I'm the one that gets the thank you letters. And I don't read those thank you letters to the church. It would be monotonous. That's why they give. And so, but I have, we'll help somebody with a bill. We'll repair a car. We'll pay a mortgage payment. We'll do all kinds of things. But they send me the little thank you cards. Look here. Here's a couple of them that I received recently. Guess who they were addressed to? Okay. They were addressed to me and they thanked me for giving that to them. It wasn't mine. That's God's money to do the kingdom with. Okay, waitresses do that. Construction people do that. All kinds of people do that. All right. So, uh, verse 7. And how much do uh, you owe uh, my employer? He asked. I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat, as was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. Now, I want you to notice what his boss did. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. All right, this really upsets some good Christians because here's what he's saying. There's worldly wisdom and there's God's kingdom. When we're here, see, some people think, oh, now that I'm a Christian, everything is godly. No, you're a Christian. That means the Holy Spirit's come into your spirit and made you a new creation. He is your righteousness. You don't have any self-righteousness. Okay, so that's where we are as Christians, but we're still in this world. And if we're worldly, that will nullify what, what went on with our encounter with Christ. So we have the kingdom of God, but we are still in the kingdom of this world. All right, so there are rules that govern the kingdom of the world. I have people say, I'm not going to pay my taxes because I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Well, they're idiots because they don't understand what the earth is all about. The earth is all about the devil giving opportunity for us to grow in the Lord and natural law to give us opportunity to grow in wisdom and good ideas and bad ideas being debated in the world so that we can understand the dyna dynamics of human behavior, the dynamics of God's intervention, the dynamics of those things. Everything in the earth is set up for us to make choices for God, because God desires a people. All right, so here, if you, here it says the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world, okay, see that? The children of this world, those are not kingdom of God people, are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. I've watched that for decade after decade, being a pastor of thousands. And it's so important that we understand Here's the lesson. All right. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. 
then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you all. Uh, will welcome you. Uh, I'm sorry. They will welcome you to an eternal home. All right. So in other words, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to say something here. I shouldn't say on this recording, but I think Obama's problem and Biden's problem is they don't know how to deal with strong men. They want to talk about everything. Have you noticed that if Biden calls a world leader and talks to him on the phone for two hours, they do the opposite of what Biden wanted? Nobody wants to talk to Biden for two hours. All right. So so we have to understand how to deal with strong men. That's a worldly principle. OK, we have to know how to deal with investments. We have to know how to deal with uh, work and income. And things like that. So there are good ideas and bad ideas here in the world. The communists are way off track. The Marxists are way off track because they don't understand human nature. It's free market capitalism that incentivizes us to make a profit by serving others, providing goods or services for them. To the degree that we serve other people is the degree that we will learn. That's our value in the world. Our value to God, though, is based on the cross of Jesus. All right, so here's what he says. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in larger ones. So in other words, let's say you only make $100 a year. Tithe on it, invest a little bit of it, and live on 80% of it. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. So you got to figure that out. If you're faithful with the little stuff, then you're going to get more stuff. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, there you go. Who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one of them and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. All right, so the rest of this chapter deals with that idea, and it is huge. And the issue is, prioritize the kingdom of God, but be wise. Be wise with worldly ideas that are necessary so you understand um, how to operate in this world. Okay, that's enough for today. Uh, great being with you today. The Lord Jesus bless you this week, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. 